I'm going to, yeah, I believe it is now. Yep, it's recording. Um, so yeah, welcome to this uh, talk um, by uh, Randy Ray. Uh, this is, this is uh, sponsored by um, the uh, Simons Rock uh, College. Uh, okay, there's Randy now, so. And uh, okay, so, um, but then certainly if you uh, have anything to say, Yan, um, I'm sure we'd be interested in that too. This is uh, the Simons Rock uh, Levy Economics Institute uh, 3-2 program. Um, and, uh, and then this is also co-sponsored by the Open Society um, University Network. And I'll just chat um, a couple of our, that we've had two talks so far, so we're just sort of inventing this. Um, climate Network. Uh, so these are sort of climate change uh, talks and uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Randy talk about uh, the Green New Deal in this context. So um, welcome everyone. And uh, so I will uh, now introduce uh, uh, Professor Randy Ray. Uh, Randy is a senior scholar um, and professor at Levy Economics Institute and a professor of economics at Bard College. Um, his current research focuses on providing a critique of orthodox monetary theory and policy and the development of an alternative approach. He also publishes extensively in the areas of full employment policy and more generally fiscal policy with president uh, of Levy Economics Institute, Dmitry Papadimitriou is working to publish or republish the work of the late financial economist Hyman Minsky and is using Minsky's approach to analyze the current global financial crisis. Um, and uh, also um, I'm using his uh, new textbook in intermediate macroeconomics next semester. And I'm, I'm greeting you from Econometrics uh, at Simon's Rock uh, where we just watched uh, Randy's uh, session. Additionally, uh, Ray taught at the University of Missouri, Kansas City from 1999 to 2016 and at the University of Denver from 1987 to 1999 and has been a visiting professor at the universities of Paris and Rome. Uh, he holds a BA from the University of the Pacific and an MA and PhD from Washington University where he was a student of Minsky. Uh, he has recently completed a Fulbright specialist grant at the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. Um, so it is my... Uh, Pleasure and uh, honor to introduce uh, Randy, who I've personally learned a lot from, and um, he's going to talk with us about um, COVID response and the Green New Deal lessons from the Levy Economics Institute. Uh, and then I imagine that we'll have about uh, half an hour of discussion, um, and then uh, and then we can have about twenty minutes of conversation. And if it goes over, you know, a few minutes, that's fine as well. So please. Um, you know, hold off con you know, questions and then at the end, uh, you know, raise your hand or uh, do the hand raising thing and I'll try to uh, call on you. And then if you're a student in the class um, or a visitor, you come over to this table, this uh, chair over here and ask your question, please. And uh, maybe we can get Jan to say something as well. So welcome uh, very much and thanks uh, Randy for uh, taking time out of your day after a conference and also uh, Martha, at um, the Pepe uh, Levy Economics Institute for helping uh, organize this session. And uh, also my uh, colleagues, uh, Leanne Usher and Harold Hastings for organizing the uh, Open University Climate Network talks with me. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks. Um, can I share my screen? Is yes, one second. This is, um, okay. it should, uh, <clears throat> I have to figure out how to do this. Sharing. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there it is. So, of course, I'm not going to um, talk about the science of greening the economy. Um, I will be um, focusing on the uh, question of how do you pay for uh, the response to multiple pandemics. So let me explain why I'm talking about multiple pandemics <laughs> instead of 
just COVID or uh, even just the Green New Deal. So first, uh, it's pretty unlikely that COVID-19 is gonna be our last experience with COVID. Uh, this is going to come back again and again, either as COVID or something else. Um, we face climate catastrophe, uh, racism, forever wars, forever fires, inequality of various kinds, uh, problems of health in healthcare, education, housing, wealth, jobs, poverty, unemployment, homelessness, financialization of our economy, secular stagnation, refugees, rising sea levels, and so on. And um, what really drove this home for me uh, was uh, Naomi Klein uh, reading, uh, I mean, any of her books, um, but the most recent ones in which um, she tackled this notion of American exceptionalism. And of course, we usually think of that as being exceptional in a good way, <laughs> but she's focusing on American exceptionalism in the very bad way from the moment Europeans arrived on this continent um, and built an economy based on exploitation, exploitation of Native Americans, but also of the environment. Uh, resources seemed limitless, and um, so there was no, no need to uh, conserve, just exploit them, use them up, and then move on, uh, forever moving west. But more importantly, the crises are all interlinked. They have to be tackled at once. This is not a matter of deciding, well, let's do COVID, and then we'll do the Green New Deal, and then maybe we'll do racism. They're all interlinked interlinked. They need to be tackled all at once. So it's a, a big agenda and people worry about how we're going to pay for it. Um, I started this work with uh, Yeva Narcissian and you can see our original Green New Deal uh, paper, which was tackling only that one issue. And um, we went through an exercise to figure out how do you figure out first what it costs and what does it mean to say it costs? Uh, and then how do you pay for it? And what does it mean to say pay for? Um, and uh, meanwhile, COVID hit and um, suddenly MMT was in the news uh, that, okay, MMT has found this new way to pay for uh, our COVID response. The central bank just prints up money, flies helicopters and drops it into the economy. Okay, so it's a complete misunderstanding or misrepresentation of what MMT is. Uh, but uh, okay, we're, we're very happy that they discovered that you don't need to worry so much about uh, deficits. Uh, but MMT is only for a crisis. Uh, it's dangerous, it's inflationary, it could lead us on the path to Zimbabwe. So we're only gonna do it uh, this one time, okay? And we, we already see the Biden administration uh, proposing to pay for uh, the next two rounds of response uh, by imposing taxes, which was what the previous panel was all about. So I'm not gonna repeat that stuff. But um, the point is how quickly we have moved away from spend whatever it takes to we got to pay for the spending, okay? So there was just a momentary recognition that, you know, how do we pay for it through a tax increase uh, was set aside, but we're already back there again, unfortunately. So our response to this is, you know, first, it's a, a multiple permanent pandemics. They're not going to end. Second, uh, we did not advocate helicopters flying money and uh, putting checks in everybody's mailbox. MMT says there's only one way that modern governments spend. They credit bank reserves and the banks credit the deposit accounts of the recipients. That's a description. It's not a policy recommendation. It's not something you pull out in order to deal with the pandemic. This is the way modern governments always spend. Um, 
Paul Samuelson in 1974 gave a very interesting interview uh, to Mark Blaug. If you Google this, you can find it online and watch the interview. Um, there's a segment in which uh, for a moment, he decides to let uh, Blaug in on a little secret. Um, and that is that, you know, we always say in normal times, you want to tax and then spend and uh, maybe in a recession, it's okay to borrow, uh, but you have to worry about the sustainability conditions of government debt. Uh, this is something we were arguing about uh, in the previous session. You have to ensure your growth rate is above your interest rate, otherwise um, it won't be sustainable. And increasing government spending lowers the growth rate because government is less efficient than the private sector and raises the interest rate because the government is increasing the borrowing. It also burdens the grandkids. And so uh, we really need to try to avoid uh, running deficits. Uh, money printing causes inflation, so that's even worse than borrowing. So anyway, Samuelson says, look, actually, these are all stories that we tell the population and the elected representatives, uh, because if they knew the truth, we can't trust them. They might try to spend too much, and then, uh-oh, what have you done? So we know that this isn't true. And occasionally, you will see other prominent uh, people in policymaking positions or in academia who will also uh, say virtually the same thing. So Bernanke in the global financial crisis, when the Fed spent and lent $29 trillion, uh, Congress asked him, are you spending taxpayer money? He said, no, it's not tax money. We simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account. Now he was talking about Fed spending and lending, but the Fed is the treasury's bank and all treasury spending goes through the Fed. So he's saying it's keystrokes, and that's just as true of treasury spending as it is of uh, the Fed spending. Or uh, a couple of decades before that, Greenspan was asked, is Social Security gonna go bankrupt? Because there's so many um, uh, people and organizations trying to push the idea that Social Security is unsustainable that uh, we need to either cut the benefits or increase the taxes because we're gonna go bankrupt. Greenspan responded, the United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there's zero probability of default. Now, I don't like the fact that he said print money because that conjures in everyone's mind that, oh, there's a printing press in the basement somewhere and they're printing up uh, currency. Uh, he should have said, you know, it's keystrokes, the same way that Bernanke put it. Um, but what he said was true. We can't run out of money. It's the government's own money. So uh, the orthodox view, even though they know it's not true, is that you need taxes in order to spend. So you tax first, then spend. The MMT view is the opposite. You have to spend and then tax. Um, if you think about um, the accounting for government spending. Uh, the Fed has to credit bank reserves uh, in order to spend, and it has to debit bank reserves whenever taxes are paid. Uh, you can't take out what you have not put in. You got to put the reserves into the system before you pull them out through tax payments. So we've all been to a magic show and uh, we've seen the magician pull the rabbit out of the hat. We pretend we're surprised so we can go along with the, the trick. Um, but we know they put the rabbit in the hat first. The same has to be true for reserves. The only sources of reserves are treasury spending, central bank purchases, or central bank lending. You got to put the reserve rabbits in the hat before you pull them out. Now, this is so confusing for economists uh, who should be able to do simple accounting, uh, but virtually all economists have been trained in the Keynesian injection leakage approach. They all know you have to inject income into the economy before it can leak out in the form of saving. 
So they all know the direction of causation, uh, or at least have been taught that the direction of causation goes from investment to saving. But the same must be true for government spending, which is the injection, and taxes, which are the leakage. So it sounds so strange uh, to economists when MMT says you have to spend first, then tax. But it's exactly the same principle uh, as the Keynesian injection leakage uh, approach, which says you've got to invest before you can save. Uh, and they should also understand you have to uh, spend uh, by the government before you can tax by the government. In any case, uh, government spending takes one form only. Congress or parliament authorizes spending uh, by formulating a budget. The treasury cuts checks, central bank clears them by crediting reserves. The budgetary outcome is known only ex post. Uh, as Stephanie Keltnoy says, cash registers do not discriminate. Too much spending either by the government or by the private sector can cause inflation. Keynes argued that true inflation only occurs beyond full employment. And when you have true inflation, you need to fight that by reducing demand, either private sector demand or the government sector demand. However, you can get inflation before full employment. And that occurs due to bottlenecks of resources, pricing power of firms or of labor unions. Um, and he argued uh, it's doubtful whether you should fight that with austerity. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to depress demand if you are not at full employment. You need to take another approach to fighting inflation that occurs before full employment. And just as a, um, uh, a footnote, uh, we probably are going to face some low inflation over the next two years, a uh, slight uptick, and it's going to be semi-inflation. It's not going to be because we have achieved full employment uh, of either labor or of our um, uh, physical uh, productive capacity. It's going to be due to bottlenecks and pricing power, okay? And that should not be fought by trying to reduce aggregate demand. We need to deal with them directly rather than uh, taking a general approach and trying to depress aggregate demand. Now, when you go into a major war, you are going to face uh, demand-caused uh, inflation. So in 1940, uh, Keynes wrote a pamphlet uh, on how to pay for the war. And so uh, I'm arguing that we take the same approach as we take on all of these pandemics that we face. Um, it could be that uh, tackling all of the pandemics uh, is actually going to be less of a demand on our nation's resources than World War II was. And I think that's probable. I think it's not likely we're gonna need 50% of our nation's output to tackle all of these pandemics. I'll give you the numbers for the Green New Deal. And uh, they are relatively small, actually. Uh, but let's approach it in the same way that we did uh, approach World War II. So Keynes argued, Government has control of the banking and currency system. They can always find the cash to pay for the purchases of domestic goods. So there is no problem with coming up with the finance. He says the problem comes after the government has bought them. The government's expenditure. Alleviate will... my guilt, you know, get rid of that because I'm doing stuff. Uh, the, com the problem comes after the government is spent because it will be putting purchasing power into the hands of the population, but it has already removed the resources, so there's nothing for them to buy. So that is what will cause the inflation. So what do you want to do? You want to use deferred compensation to reward workers. You say that uh, we may have to reduce your income now, or at the very least, we're not gonna increase your income, uh, but we're going to compensate you for that later. He argued that this is much better than taxing.
because taxing takes income away permanently. So let's use uh, deferred compensation. Second, tax higher incomes. That is people who have um, uh, far more income than they need in order to maintain a decent living standard. Um, and then actually increase the income at the bottom uh, on the argument that they're already making huge sacrifices for the war. And so we need to um, compensate them for making those sacrifices. So resource not finance is the true constraint. I like the way that uh, JFAG Foster, an institutionalist put it. It's very similar to Keynes, but very uh, simple. Whatever is technically feasible is financially possible. So if we know how to do it and we have the resources uh, to accomplish the objective, we can always provide the finance for it. So where's the money gonna come from? The, the only uh, two institutions we permit to create money, the treasury of the sovereign and the commercial banks. Okay, so we can always uh, do that. Now, uh, both Keynes and Foster were talking about mobilizing your domestic resources. Uh, we also, uh, in the United States, have access to external resources because the dollar is the main international reserve currency. Uh, a lot of countries are trying to accumulate more dollar reserves. Um, and so potentially, we not only can mobilize all of our domestic resources, but also uh, utilize part of the rest of the world's resources. However, uh, we should not do that because the rest of the world faces the same or many of the same pandemics that we face. So we can't monopolize the resources. And as you know, right now, there is a discussion about the, um, the rich world's uh, domination of the supply of vaccines. So we should not be trying to utilize the foreign resources. So what, what we need to do is mobilize all the resources that we have available domestically, uh, shift from destructive uses to constructive uses, and then create new resources as we go along. And the Biden plan is um, doing some of that, creating some of the new resources we need. How are we going to shift the resources? Taxes, postponed consumption, patriotic saving, rationing, and regulations. Uh, we used all of those in World War II. I think we're probably not going to need uh, to get to the end of that list. Uh, we're probably not going to need rationing or regulations because it seems like the demand on resources is not going to be that great. And then you spend in, quarter, in order to allocate the resources uh, to achieve the public purpose. Okay, how much does it cost? Well, I um, have not done this work, but I just wanted to mention, so we have to deal with the pandemic of racism and of racial inequality. Uh, Darity has already done a calculation uh, for reparations uh, for the descendants of um, slaves. Uh, and uh, what he's trying to do is increase the wealth of black families up to average wealth of white families because uh, as Darity argues, the problem is not just income. The problem is uh, the lack of wealth, which is necessary in order to, um, to really have full participation in society. So his calculation is 10 to, tw 10 to 12 trillion dollars of wealth. Um, can we afford that? Of course we can. This is keystroke credits. Keystroke credits to some kind of saving fund for every um, African-American uh, family. So we can certainly afford that. Now the question is, um, do we have the resources for it? Well, we have to remember that this is wealth, not income. Uh, this is not going to fund 10 trillion extra spending for consumption uh, next year. So the demand on um, the nation's resources um, is going to be a very small fraction of that. Uh, what we're doing is putting people into a place so that they can afford uh, decent houses, decent schools, 
a decent college for their children, and so on. All the things that average white uh, families have access to that black families do not have access to because they don't have this um, financial wealth uh, on which they can depend. So anyway, uh, that is the way that you would want to approach uh, whether we can afford it in resource terms. We need to look at what it would take to provide decent schooling, decent housing, and so on uh, to African-American families. We did do a, as careful a calculation as we could do for the Green New Deal. We took a, a range of estimates of the uh, dollar costs of um, the, uh, the uh, projects that were including, included in a very broad Green New Deal, a Bernie Sanders style Green New Deal. That's why you see things listed here that uh, are not environmental projects. And um, then uh, we used the dollar number as a percent of GDP as a proxy for the demand on resources. Now, this is not perfect. Uh, when, um, I mean, as we proceed uh, to implement the, the uh, Green New Deal, uh, we need uh, people who can do a much better job at looking at the real resources that are required for each of these projects and looking to see where we can find those real resources. So I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about you know, moving labor from uh, fracking to erecting windmills. Okay, we need to get down to the nitty gritty on the um, resource requirements. So this is only a proxy. It's only a first approximation of how you go about it. Uh, then we determine whether um, uh, uh, implementing one of these programs such as Medicare for all, uh, what the net demand for resources will be. Well, we know that our medical care system uh, is by far the most expensive uh, in the world. Uh, we spend twice as much uh, relative to GDP as any other country. Our close, closest country is about half of us. So implementing uh, Medicare for all is actually going to release resources. It's not going to demand more, it's going to release them. So you can see there that that one has a negative sign and it's in red. Ending forever wars is going to release resources. Uh, uh, so we have positives and negatives. The job guarantee is both a source of resources because we're going to put people to work. Some of them can work on Green New Deal projects. Uh, but it's also a use of resource because people's wages will be higher, their income will be higher, and uh, they will be able to consume more. So we had to make um, uh, guesses about what the net resource demand would be, total all of this up, and um, it looks like it's about a 1.3% increased demand, now measured in dollars, not in resources, but increased demand for the nation's resources. This is tiny, okay? And this is a very broad-based program. So what we're saying is we should be able to achieve this without reducing resource use uh, to provide consumer goods, except for uh, we're gonna end fracking, we're gonna get off fossil fuel. So we did take account of that. Um, but otherwise, we're not going to reduce, have to reduce people's income and reduce their spending in order to achieve this. However, uh, people say, well, uh, you're probably too optimistic. So we said, okay, let's assume that we're off and we do need to reduce private demand uh, over resources. Let's put a payroll tax surcharge equal to 2% of GDP. So uh, you, you all know what the payroll tax is. It's a broad-based tax. Um, and uh, we would uh, impose this and then uh, increase Social Security benefits to begin paying them in the future. So in return for a higher uh, Social Security FICA tax on paychecks, uh, your uh, Social Security retirement 
will be much more generous in the future. And that would start soon. Uh, we, we were um, uh, planning on uh, perhaps postponing that for 10 years, but I think probably we won't have to postpone it that long. So that is postponing consumption and that is a way to reduce demand temporarily and then add demand back in, which we will need to do because once we've completed the electrical grid, uh, we're gonna stop spending as much on uh, the Green New Deal. So government spending is gonna go down and we're gonna need to move those resources into producing for um, uh, other kinds of spending. So we will put income back into uh, households and allow them to spend more to replace the declining government spending. Okay, people always claim that, uh, you know, if Congress understood this uh, and really took advantage of MMT, they're gonna spend their way to Zimbabwe and we're gonna get hyperinflation. Uh, the Bank of Canada had a, a database of sovereign defaults and um, uh, a, a blogger uh, wrote this uh, up, put the, the list. Here's the full list of um, countries that have had um, defaults. And the thing that you will see that is missing is any developed uh, capitalist uh, country. And the thing that countries here have in common is civil war, revolution, uh, breakup of the Soviet Union, and, and uh, the last one, Sri Lanka, their central bank was severely damaged by a terrorist bomb. So what I'm arguing is the, the fear that we're going to have um, uh, some kind of catastrophe if we recognize that uh, governments can spend more uh, and follow the path of some of these countries is just, um, I think, pretty silly. Won't the stimulus cause runaway inflation? If people were, were watching the um, sessions at the Levy Institute uh, today, you can see there, there's a pretty good consensus. Uh, it, it surprised me, to tell you the truth. A pretty good consensus that Larry Summers is wrong. Uh, we don't face uh, much uh, inflation. There will be some price increases but it's not gonna be true inflation. Production is recovering in the United States. Uh, it is almost recovered in China. The supply chains are recovering uh, and we still have, uh, I say 2 billion, I know that this is a, an overestimate, uh, but uh, 2 billion uh, people have come into the global economy, uh, India and China largely and uh, they are relatively low wage. They're going to want to resume exporting to the United States. And so uh, the likelihood that um, uh, inflation is gonna pick up is extremely small. Bond vigilantes, uh, the fear that uh, the debt ratio rising is gonna cause the interest rate to go up. This shows that the um, correlation of the Fed funds rate, which is the Fed's target rate, and the um, short-term interest rate, market interest rate is 99%. The long-term interest rate correlation is 88%. What this means is the interest rate is almost fully under control of the central bank. And the, the Fed, I think, has learned uh, a lot over the past uh, 20 years. Um, we're not gonna make a Volcker kind of mistake again that is push interest rates to 20%. Um, interest rates uh, have been low for a very long time. Uh, they're not gonna stay at zero, but the Fed is not gonna push them up very high. The, um, I don't know if I, how, how are we doing on time? I don't have any kind of- uh, Yeah, we've, yeah, we're doing uh, pretty good. I mean, if you would like to uh, wrap up, we can uh, move on to questions. Okay, uh, all right, I'll, I'll just finish on this point. So it's commonly believed that uh, 
policymakers determine the deficit. And that what MMT is all about is trying to increase the deficit, okay? Both of these things are false, okay? First, uh, MMT is a description of how the government spends. And so what MMT is just trying to explain is that uh, the notion of policy space uh, really only applies to resources. So that's the point I've been making uh, here today. We are constrained by our resources, not by finance, okay? Uh, we can always spend uh, what is necessary to mobilize all of our domestic resources. Spending beyond that uh, is not a good idea unless you depress spending by the private sector, okay? So that you don't get inflation. The second point is that uh, we wouldn't recommend deficit spending because uh, this is out of the control of the policymakers anyway. The, the deficit is endogenously determined. Um, it is determined largely by the performance of the economy. So when the economy dips into a recession, tax revenue disappears, some kind of spending goes up automatically like unemployment compensation, and you will in, end up with a deficit. So deficits largely come because of economic slowdowns, uh, not because policymakers decided they wanted to run a deficit. Uh, and then the second thing that goes into determining the size of the deficit is uh, the non-government sector's decisions uh, over spending, uh, borrowing, and saving. So, uh, by definition, at the aggregate level, the government's balance equals the private sector or non, let me say non-government sector's balance. If the non-government sector is running a surplus, by definition, the government sector must be running a deficit. This, uh, these lines track the US government balance and the non-government balance, which is our domestic private sector plus the rest of the world. And you can see it's a mirror image, which is, has to be because this is a, an identity, must be true. Um, the point is that when the private sector stops spending, say like when a COVID pandemic hits and you can't go to the restaurant anymore, um, its surplus goes up and the government sector's balance uh, deficit uh, goes down. That has to happen. Is there any way that the government could have a deficit less than this one in 2020? Well, only if the non-government sector had a smaller surplus. And what I'm saying is policymakers don't have a lot of control over that. So if anyone says, you know, we think the government ought to balance its budget, you have to ask them, well then, okay, how are you going to get the non-government sector, uh, which is our domestic sector, domestic private, and the foreign sector, how, how are you gonna force them to balance theirs? Because if they don't balance theirs, uh, the government cannot balance it. And um, uh, no one who proposes uh, balanced budgets for the federal government ever provides an answer to that. Uh, try it, ask them. Uh, and if they don't have an answer to that, uh, you know, they have no policy because the policy would have to get the non-government sector uh, to balance. And it's very hard to come up with a prescription for forcing the rest of the world to balance against the United States. Okay, very difficult to see how we could get, how we could force them to do that. So I'll stop. All right, thanks very much, Randy, for that uh, informative uh, talk. Uh, we're giving you a virtual uh, round of applause. Um, so yeah, so we're uh, happy to field uh, questions. So feel free to uh, type them into the chat and I can read them. Um, also, if you use the, uh, hand raise function um, on the uh, participants, 
uh, label, I can uh, do that. Um, and then also, I believe if uh, I can see you in the, uh, the screen and you have your hand up, then um, I should be able to call on you as well. So here's, uh, and I apologize in advance for mispronouncing people's names. Uh, here's a question from uh, Tyrone. Uh, what advice would you give a Bernie Sanders style candidate running for Congress in a blue dog district that wanted to achieve all these goals, but also wanted to run on setting working family income taxes to net zero up to say $100,000 a year? Um, I think, so we, we sort of discussed this um, during the, uh, the Levy presentation. I, I, you know, I would not link spending and taxing. Um, I would propose policies that make sense uh, on either side. So uh, let's de-link taxing and spending. Uh, let's promote spending that benefits the population and um, the nation. And uh, then let's separately propose tax policy that makes sense, that achieves a purpose. So you, you have to lay out what the purposes are um, and, uh, and then you can design a tax system to achieve those purposes and uh, you know, don't worry about the balance between spending and taxing. So I, I'm not exactly sure what he's getting at. As far as political advice, I don't think I can give that. I'm not good at politics. Um, I've been voting for 50 years uh, for president. I mean, every four years, not every year. Uh, and I, I only voted for the winner one time. So that tells you something. <laughs> consistently wrong. Thanks, we have a uh, question from uh, Simon uh, Groth. If you could please uh, unmute yourself and ask a question directly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the, for the talk. Um, what, what really stuns me is how little interaction and reaction is there from the orthodoxy towards MMT arguments, um, especially uh, at the panel. Um, I mean, you made those very simple arguments of the sexual balance, of the correlation between the, the interest rates set by the Fed and the short-term interest rates. And then we see Professor Furman making his argument on debt sustainability entirely on so the exogeneity of interest rates and what would happen if they would rise. What, but, but then you make your point and then those people do not react. Like there is, an, there is a void, which yeah, is really stunning to me. And I would... Um, love to ask you what your thoughts are, what they might respond if one would force them to respond or what, why they're entirely silent on those issues. Well, you know, in some ways, of course, it's going to be hardest uh, to talk to PhD economists uh, because they, they have spent uh, I mean, he's, he's not that old, but several decades at, at a minimum, several decades um, studying uh, the mainstream. Uh, I, I assume he's a basically a Keynesian, uh, you know, liberal leaning Keynesian. Uh, and so that is what he has spent his time studying. Uh, I'm sure he has heard sectoral balances now uh, five years ago, probably not at all. It would have been just, what, what on earth is that? I don't know what he's talking about. Um, I'm sure he has heard it now because now it is sort of out there. Uh, but um, I think expecting them to respond to that uh, in public um, is too much. <laughs> uh, I don't really expect them to, uh, but um, you know, you know, maybe when they're in the, the safety of their office uh, to try to get them to start thinking about things like this, you know, say, well, the, okay, like I just said, the, uh, the, the deficit outcome is ex post 
and it's not a policy variable. Okay, I mean that could set him thinking. I, I think that you know even with, within his own Keynesian framework, you could say, you know, that makes sense, and you could hope to to nudge them along, um, because they they don't have to buy everything. They don't have to buy all of MMT uh, to recognize, yeah, you've got an identity there and the identity's got to hold. And so if I'm going to counter that, I have to figure out, you know, some story about why the, the, the budget that Congress passes is going to cause the foreign sector <laughs> to change their, uh, their own desired balance somehow, you know. Uh, we saw uh, Trump try it with uh, tariffs, didn't work. And I think everyone, including Furman, know tariffs aren't going to work because the rest of the world really, really wants to export to the U.S. So how can you change that? Okay. And then if they then understand, so you can't change that one. Well, what about the private sector? Uh, I think that they can sort of inherently understand the idea that if the private sector is spending more than its income, that could be a bad idea, you know, and then show them that's what happened uh, during the Clinton years and um, uh, cause them to think about it. I think it, it, you, you have more success with people who haven't been, haven't spent 20 years studying economics. Um, they, you know, they, uh, they're less sure that they, that they understand econ, which helps. And um, ultimately, I think that the, the way that um, economic advice works politically is that politicians seek out the economist that gives them the result that they want, right? And so uh, when there's a sea change in Congress, in the president, uh, which I think we have, I think we do have a sea change, which is the view that uh, all this uh, neoliberal thought that uh, we need to get the government out of the economy, small government is better. I think we, we have a, a moment of sea change where uh, uh, lots of people in Congress uh, are now open to something different. We tried it, it doesn't work, okay? And the, the countries that continued to rely on that uh, with right-wing leaders are disasters, okay? The, the countries that took a different response and got the government heavily involved have come out much better. So I, I, I think we do have that moment. And so those politicians are open. Uh, I think that, um, the budget committee, for example, uh, the, the democratic side of the budget committee and uh, people in the CBO are open to these ideas right now Be because they want the justification, okay? They, they want to be able to spend more. They want a bigger government. And so they're open to the idea. Thanks, Randy. Uh, Leanne Usher uh, has her hand raised. Leanne, if you could... Uh ask Randy your question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to first mention that JFAG Foster's daughter is in attendance here, Lynn Foster, oh. and maybe she wants to say hello. Um, but um, uh, Randy, I wanted to ask, you know, based on uh, small countries that may be um, dependent on imports or they might have borrowed, um, in foreign currency or what have you. In, in 1933, Keynes, when he wrote The Means to Prosperity, emphasized that we need to have government spending in a coordinated fashion internationally. Is that, does that, do we require that coordination or not? Uh, obviously we do. <laughs> the, the multiple pandemics, uh, as I said, many other countries face these and I, uh, I mean, we face them together. So the the pan the COVID nineteen. Now the big worry is that um, you know. So we have some percent of the American population is going to refuse the vaccine. 
but now uh, they've realized that's irrelevant. <laughs> we can't reach herd immunity anyway because COVID is um, uh, exploding around the world in the countries that have not received uh, enough vaccines. So we can't tackle the pandemic alone. Obviously, uh, climate catastrophe is the same thing. Okay, we can't tackle it alone. And as you said, um, most or at least many countries are too poor in terms of resources. Uh, so they can't tackle uh, the pandemics in their own countries. So it's our responsibility. We have to help them, of course. Uh, you know, they're not going to produce their own vaccines. We have to supply them. Uh, they can't produce their own solar pa panels. We have to supply them. Uh, we're responsible. The U.S. Um, and other uh, rich countries are responsible for the mess we're in in terms of climate change. So it's our responsibility to mount the biggest response. Okay, so it's not just that they can't do it, but also uh, the burden has to be on us because we were the big polluters that caused the problem in the first place. So yeah, it has to be coordinated and it, it, it has to be coordinated by governments. So there's a role for the private sector to play but the coordination has to be government. Thanks, it's uh, 5.03. Uh, Randy's agreed to uh, answer some more questions. Uh, so I think we can continue, um, but if people have to leave, if uh, anyone has questions about the uh, Simon Schrock Levy 3.2 program, uh, please contact me. Um, or if they have questions about uh, the uh, Open Society Climate Network, uh, contact uh, Leanne Harold or I. Um, and then if they have questions about the Levy Economics Institute, they can contact uh, Martha uh, Pepa um, or locate information on the website. Uh, so I'll continue with some uh, questions from the chat here. Um, yeah, let, let me just, before you extend an invitation, because I think Randy's ideas on sectorial balances and, and this question of, of generating resources is exactly the way we th need to think in terms of tackling climate change. And so I want to just second Ty's invitation that we're planning a, a series of seminars continuing in the fall and, and really uh, hope to uh, uh, get a widespread participation because I think the problem is less and less the technology and more and more an understanding of allocation of resources. Thanks, Harold. Would you, do you want to ask, ask your questions or do you want me to ask them? Oh, uh, they're very naive, but I'll, I'll ask them uh, to, uh, to, to Randy anyway. I not, uh, uh, just one of them relates to your question on taxes of what you would think of simplifying the tax code so it's somehow in effect, uh, I'll call it a VAT on personal income. In other words, it's something that's very simple that, you know, from all this data, it is a simple mathematical increasing function, probably starting at some level of income. Uh, we could debate this and, and eliminating virtually all deductions and things just to, to to, to try to bring resource uh, consumption into balance. And the other is, and I, I, I'm just puzzled over this. Uh, you've talked about availability of resources and if population growth slows down as everyone expects it will, uh, what additional limits does that impose? Okay. Um, so you, Hyman Minsky, my professor, <laughs> I uh, really like the VAT. Um, I would have to admit that I, I haven't studied it, but what you want is a, uh, a broad-based uh, either consumption or income tax if you're trying to free up resources. I think that that is the best kind of tax. And so the VAT uh, would be a form of consumption tax um, 
on the the uh, exemptions. Um, well, perhaps. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the exemptions are designed to promote uh, social policy. So, you know, we allow deductions for children, number of children, on the argument that um, raising a family is expensive. Um, we had a policy to promote home ownership. Okay, maybe a good idea, maybe not. Uh, so, but we have a deduction for that. Um, so we, we have to think about what's the alternative way then to take care of families with children. Well, okay, we could have a child allowance. You can do it on the spending side instead of on the taxing side. So if you have children, you get a family allowance, so a check from the government. That could be an alternate, alternative way to do that. Um, the good thing about an income tax over a consumption tax is that we can have a, uh, a very high exemption level. So for example, nobody earning under $40,000 would pay an income tax. So it's a pretty easy way to exempt. The, the way that they try to do it with um, consumption taxes is you say, well, we're not gonna tax necessities. So that's an indirect way of um, protecting lower income people uh, who presumably spend almost all of their consumption spending on necessities, so you exempt those. So I think there's some advantages of simplicity of an income tax with a very high exemption, uh, and then maybe some deductions to promote the kinds of, of spending that you want, like spending on your kids. Um, on uh, the resources, um, if you, you saw earlier, uh, you know, some people are, are, they link labor, population growth to labor force growth to economic growth. And so they're very worried that because we're aging society with declining population growth, that we're gonna have much lower economic growth. I think this is really wrong headed. Um, first, uh, people can work longer and they will work longer if they have decent job prospects and appropriate jobs, okay? Um, I think that uh, people retire for a variety of reasons, uh, but one is lack of access to good paying jobs. So usually your peak income comes about age 55 and it's sort of downhill for, uh, uh, the majority of the population after that. So that's one of the problems. We need to provide decent pay. And then some jobs are just too hard. Okay, so, you know, there's a problem with blue collar type jobs that they become too difficult. So we have to find jobs that older people can do. Um, so one answer to that is uh, let people work longer, okay, if they want to. Uh, but you know, at the same time that we have this great fear of zero population growth or even maybe negative because of the impact on um, economic growth, we also have the great fear that robots are going to take all the jobs away. So <laughs> put these two things together and you see the solution is uh, pretty simple uh, and I think inevitable that um, uh, productivity uh, will continue to rise and it could ramp up uh, as long as we keep aggregate demand up. Uh, I, I see productivity as a residual. So if you have rapid growth of aggregate demand, you will have rapid growth of productivity. First, because you're going to operate close to capacity. And second, because you have an incentive to invest. And if workers are in short supply, uh, you know, not only will, will their wages be rising, which creates demand, but also you have an incentive for technological innovation to replace human labor, which is a, a good thing, um, as long as we keep people who want to work fully employed. So uh, I, I, I think we're going to continue to grow. Now, then you get the question, but hold a second, growth is bad for the environment. But that is extrapolating from the past. 
okay? And I think that's a mistake. We have to rethink what growth is and what rising living standards is, okay? We definitely cannot have more throughput. That is taking increasing our use of natural resources, either in the production process or to absorb all the pollution. We can't continue to do that, that's obvious. So we have to uh, grow and reduce damage to the environment at the same time. Uh, and that means a different kind of growth. But you know that's what policy is for. That's what we need to, to promote, growth while reducing damage to the environment and reversing the damage we've already done. So I think there's plenty of room for economic growth, but it has to be a different kind. Uh, and then finally, it has to be more shared. Uh, so we, ha we have to increase the, the living standards at the bottom relative to the living standards at the top, okay? But, but we need to rethink what a good living standard is. It should not be ability to go shopping in the mall, okay? That, that's not a good living standard and it's not good for the environment. So Minsky always used to promote communal consumption, public consumption. Okay, we need more of that uh, and a lot less private consumption. And that will actually improve people's lives too. They will be happier. Okay. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I guess we have a few more uh, questions here. Um, thanks for uh, answering them. So this is from uh, Praben Basyal. Is there any caveat on applicability of MMT explanation to underdeveloped developing sovereign nations? Yeah. Well, uh, so with your own currency, you can mobilize your own domestic resources. Okay. And by definition, in a developing country, those are limited. So the limits faced are much greater. Uh, in the United States, we can mobilize our own resources which of course are huge, unprecedented, okay? Uh, greater than any country ever had. Uh, now China will replace us or, or are in the process of replacing us uh, as uh, having the greatest uh, quantity and quality of resources. Um, so that's already, uh, you know, we have much fewer constraints even just using our own resources than any developing country. That's by definition. I mean, that's why they're developing. They're on the, hopefully on the path to becoming a developed country. Okay, but then in addition, we can demand resources all over the world because the rest of the world wants dollars. So of course, uh, they face greater constraints than we do both ways. Uh, they probably have very little ability to command resources outside their country. So that is a huge constraint for them. Uh, and then their domestic resources are limited. The one thing that almost all developing countries have is labor and they don't utilize it, okay? So the, their policies are not aimed at mobilizing their most important domestic resource, which is labor. So that is a failing, that's a mistake. At a very minimum, they should have every worker in the country working. When, when Sweden used to be a poor country, we all think of Sweden now, you know, as being this fantastically uh, rich country, I mean, for the population size. But uh, it wasn't long ago that Sweden was a very poor country. They enacted a full employment program that guaranteed everyone a job. Now, it wasn't the, the job guarantee program we advocate, but in fact, anyone who wanted a job had a job and they justified this on the basis of, we're too poor to afford any unemployed people. We need everybody employed, okay? If we were a rich country, we could afford unemployment, but we're a poor country, we can't afford it. That's the right uh, way to view it if you're a developing country. And then of course, Sweden developed, became a rich country. Uh, now, I'm not trying to, to say that it's as easy to do. Uh, 
if you're a small, poor African country or Latin American country as it was for Sweden. Uh, but I'm saying the strategy has to be, you have to fully employ your population, okay? That's gotta be part of the development strategy. And then you 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 still face constraints. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, I guess I'll just uh, keep going with the questions. Um, this is from uh, Nitin Nair. Uh, would MMT advocate the abolishment of a link or peg with commodity money uh, like gold? If yes, how would the value of money be determined? Would it use something like the quantity theory of money? Okay, well, uh, of course, uh, there are very few countries that, um, or, that link to commodities, uh, either now or in the past. So I, I know people have a misconception that sort of the normal thing was to have a gold standard or a silver standard. That's not true. You go back 4,000 years, so as far back as you go in time and around the world, that is actually very, very rare, okay? It's a made up story by Austrian economists. It's just not true. So that is not a normal thing at all. Uh, what people call fiat money is the normal thing as far as you go back in time. That's the usual case that is not linked to a, uh, a precious metal. I don't like the term fiat because it's, it's not, it doesn't conjure up uh, anything that's accurate. Uh, the currency doesn't have value because the government tells you it has value, okay? That would be fiat. Um, and uh, it's really not because there are legal tender laws either because uh, those aren't, those, uh, Knapp said, that's a pious wish. That's very hard for the government to enforce, okay? Very difficult. So that's not it either. Uh, really what they are, are tax driven currencies. So they have value because the, um, the sovereign, whether it's a, a monarch or a democratically elected uh, government uh, can impose obligations. In the past, it was mostly fees and fines, but now it's mostly taxes they can impose an obligation that they can enforce, okay? That's much easier than saying, you must accept currency in any transaction. That's hard because the, the state has to be right there in every transaction, okay? But saying, you must pay me a tax or you go to prison or face other even worse consequences, um, that's relatively easy to enforce. Uh, and so that is what drives the currency. Now that creates a demand for the currency. It doesn't tell you how much it will buy. It tells you how much you have to deliver to get out of debt to the sovereign, okay? So it ensures it does have a value and uh, you know what the value is in terms of paying down your tax liability, but it doesn't tell you what you can buy in a market. So what determines that? Um, well, it's what do you have to do to get the currency? Uh, in uh, uh, modern uh, monetary capitalist economies, it's largely wages. So for most people, that's what you got to do. You got to work. And so it's uh, determined by uh, how many hours do you have to work? So the, there's some uh, similarity to the labor theory of value. And on the margin, uh, we could do that. We could set a labor standard explicitly by law uh, so that you know exactly what the marginal value of an hour of labor is. And we do that with the job guarantee. So if you have to work an hour to get $15, you know exactly what $15 is worth. It will buy you one hour of labor, okay? Um, so that uh, on the margin, that's what sets it. What do you have to do to get it? 
if um, uh, I mean the, the government can name what you have to do in order to get it. Once we've de developed a, a, a market economy, there's lots of different things you can do. So it's not so clear cut. Okay. Lots of other things you can do in order to get dollars. Thanks, Randy. Uh, Alex Yulka has been patiently uh, waiting with a uh, virtual raised hand. Alex, could, could you please uh, unmute yourself and ask Randy your question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Randy. It was very clear and uh, very illuminating uh, presentation. And just my question is, um, you have calculated that it's a, well, first of all, you present the multiple crisis as a framework, okay? So this is not triple crisis, but it's multiple, okay? And uh, that's a good frame. Um, then you mentioned that the cost of all these crises would not be high as some people are predicting. But I would insist perhaps with, and from a different angle. Um, what about if the crisis, all of them, as you say, they are simultaneously going on. What about if they it happen much more at the same time and not only the direct impacts, which you have calculated, no, 1%, 2%, total is not too much. Um, from the you know perspective of um, so what about the indirect effects the ripple effects which uh, for, and also the the interconnections of these multiple crisis effects for example just to finish the question uh, we never expected that um, <clears throat> pandemic which is not an economic variable the uh, you know, had this impact on the economic sphere. Um, we, we were accustomed to have even the Great Depression, right? It's a financial or economic rooted uh, crisis, but not from the social perspective. So this impact was bigger than maybe many could have predicted. And, you know, so that's what I'm saying. When we have a multiple crisis, we have the environmental side, the political side, the conflictive, the conflict part. We have different array of type of, of nature of crisis that we don't know because we are economies only. So I, I don't know if you would in the future, you try to kind of get a gross figure, but from the ripple effects, indirect effects, side effects, rather than only the, the most direct effects. Or perhaps you already have thought about it, but that, that's what I want to ask my question. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so our Green New Deal was um, tackling climate change, so the greening. Uh, it had the job guarantee. It had Medicare for all, and it had war. Okay, so that's only four. Uh, so, but those were all included. Now, think about how those help deal with the other pandemics, okay? Uh, so war creates lots of refugees. Climate change creates lots of refugees. Um, so you are also at least partially addressing the refugee problems. Um, job guarantee provides jobs to anyone who wants to work at $15 an hour. You're tackling unemployment. You are tackling poverty. Just as a mathematical exercise, we've done this. If every family in America had one job guarantee job, you will lift virtually all poor children out of poverty. This one program will do it. Now, of course, not every family uh, uh, is going to have a, a member who can or will or should have a full-time job. So this, this is an overestimate, uh, but potentially it could uh, do that. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, if you use a, a broad array of programs, um, they're going to help. 
and extend beyond the pandemic, the particular pandemics you're going after. Okay, they're going to help in a lot of other ways. Um, and so our estimate was uh, that, yeah. let's call it 2%. Uh, and, and let's say we were off by 200%, <laughs> okay, or more. Let's say it's 5% of GDP. Uh, we're tackling a huge uh, amount of the pandemics that we face. Um, and it's only 5% of GDP. I just can't see how we get up to 50% of GDP. Okay, I can't see it. And, and so let, we, we need to expand beyond our borders, help other countries too. Um, but we accomplished 50% in World War II is my point. Okay, we got up to 50% in World War II. And, um, you know, there were hardships in terms of people worked longer hours. But in World War II, remember that a vast majority of the production uh, was not improving people's lives. It, it was blowing things up. And uh, a very large percentage of our labor force was taken out of the production of stuff and then, you know, sent abroad uh, to fight or to support the fighters. Um, but still we did it without major hardships at home. And we came out of World War II infinitely stronger than when we went in. We, we, came, we went into World War II uh, with a country that was just starting to become a developed country. And we came out the strongest country in the world. And then we had a period of unprecedented growth. And so did the rest of the world, unprecedented growth. Um, so I just don't, I don't see the, this is something we need to fear in terms of the resources. Uh, I think that we can easily devote the resources we need to the pandemic uh, without a lot of suffering and we will emerge much better off than we did. Um, the, the estimates we did for the greening part were for programs that lasted 10 years. And they were much more ambitious than, than even Biden's. So 10 year uh, uh, effort uh, to green the economy to a greater degree than um, Biden's will. And it was, a, it was so small, such a small percent of resource use. Um, and it's not destructive resource use, which war is, okay? So I don't see the challenge as being that big, really. Politically, yes, the, I can't deal with the politics, okay? That's hard, uh, but I'm just saying in terms of the economics, the financing and the resources, I don't see it as a big challenge. All right. Yeah. Thanks very much. I think that's a great uh, place to end. We didn't get to all of the questions, but thanks very much, Randy, uh, for staying with us to answer these questions. I think it's really uh, informative and interesting uh, comments. Um, and then uh, lastly, if you have interest in the uh, 3-2 program, Simon's Rock and the Levy Economics Institute, please uh, contact me. Um, or the uh, Open Society uh, Climate Network, uh, Leanne Harold or I, um, and then about uh, Levy Economics Institute, uh, please contact Martha Tepepa or see them on their website. Um, so, and thank you everyone for uh, staying with us. And, uh, and if you didn't go to the Minsky conference, it was, it was great. So um, hopefully we'll see you there tomorrow otherwise. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.